Franklin Library, uh, building the future of the nation's first public library, um, the Library Association from 1858 to 2022. And that's available from our friends at the Franklin Library. Um, so please go up there and check it out. And we also have a special bookmarker, Sense is Preferable to Sound, and we have a great picture of the uh, library taken by our best photographer, Paul Vicario. So it's uh, also on the front page of our uh, book. But is, um, and then just to give you an idea, I'm just gonna present a brief overview of the Franklin Library Association. And then we are very fortunate to have with us um, Patricia St. Aubin to my left, uh, PhD candidate with expertise in the history of the Ben Franklin, inspires Providence Library Company. Uh, we also have James Johnston, as well known to everyone in Franklin, author, historian, and former Franklin selectman. And we are also fortunate to have Professor Robert Lawson, professor of history and director of the honors program at Dean College. But before I begin, I would just like to share a brief overview of Oliver Dean. Oliver Dean helped establish and was the first president of the Franklin Library. Um, and then also had gone on, um, which was our first and oldest continually used public lending library in the US. One of the things I looked back at our books um, going back to 1858, um, and the first meeting in which Oliver Dean was elected was back in January of 1859. It's just remarkable, the connection between Oliver Dean um, and the good works. And one of the things that inspired me is, you know, we're never, we're never too old to make a difference. So Oliver Dean was elected as the president of Franklin Library Association when he was 76 years old. So it just says a lot about people's commitment to education as well as um, to community, uh, particularly taking on such a civic responsibility for our library. So one of the things that I would like to do is just to begin with what was called, it's called Elegy. And it's written as an ode to Franklin, written by Wallace Ruthven Richardson in 1882. Uh, and I'd like to just share it with you because one of the things that my experience has taught me is History is, is our past, it's our present, but it's also our future. And one of the things that this particular poem speaks so elegantly to is those people that came before us. I pause to make an offering here, a poet's tribute at the beer of one who trod the ways of truth, the source, the source of strength to man and youth. Horace Mann, thy honor to, Thy honored name throughout the world is known to fame. The trophies of thy matchless mind in all the worlds a lodgment find. For wisdom, moral force, and power, a line of names appear this hour. Fair products of New England soil in art and science and in toil. Thurston, Fisher, Metcalf, Thayer, Gilmore, Rockland, Bullard, Ware, Adams, Daniels, Whiting, Dean, Kingsbury, Clark, Ray, Pond, and Green, Richardson and Bacon, too, Nason, Woodward, Blake, Ballou. Other names I, too, do find, kind in heart and rich in mind. And I think it's just a great way to lead off with this particular poem. And one of the things that the past 16 years has taught me, and I would really be remiss to not just look at such the rich history of this town and all the people that were so instrumental in the Franklin Library Association. And certainly this isn't inclusive by any means, but some, at least in the, probably in the last 50 years or more, I would just like to really honor the, the lasting legacy that many of these individuals made that really changed the course of the Franklin Library. It certainly wasn't without its challenges um, over the last 150 years. And some of these individuals include Elizabeth Brunelli, Howard Warcup, Henry Frenier, 
Ann L. Whalen, Clara M. Lodi, Eleanor Crothers, and certainly our very own Nancy J. Rappa, um, who's been instrumental. One of the other things that a great And one of the things that I just wanted to highlight, as you know, when the Franklin Library Association started, women didn't have the right to vote, and a lot of what was going on was behind the scenes of some very strong and influential women. Please come on in, have a seat. Uh, one of the things I'd like to just share with you, which is also um, in our book titled Sisters in Philanthropy, Vicki, uh, Nancy and Vicki Buchanio Earls, um, our reference librarian was really instrumental in leading the charge to tell the story of the Ray sisters, who ensured that the Ray Memorial Library was built in honor of their parents, and just the many good works that they had done for the town of Franklin. The chapter, Sisters in Philanthropy, is a reflection of their compassion towards all people and services to helping children as well as the greater community. There were things in terms of when they went around and gave out food baskets, um, there's stories of, I believe, Lydia um, volunteering her time to work with children in Providence. Um, there were just so many things that they've done and they have completed, and one of the things was certainly um, bestowing the library upon the town. So let me just briefly highlight a few sections of the book that I think reflect an early commitment to offer a place for the inhabitants of Franklin to read, to socialize, well, certainly while discussing current events and fostering community spirit. Um, as we all know, today actually marks Ben Franklin's 316th birthday. So certainly we owe a tribute to Ben Franklin. Um, as we all know the story of when the townspeople wrote a letter to Ben Franklin um, asking for a bell for the steeple for their church. And Ben sent over um, through his sister, he put together uh, a list of books that would be bestowed upon the town. And as we all know, and you'll, you'll find in our specially marked bookmarkers, sense is preferable to sound. And that was certainly the beginning of a, really, as my wife has so kindly reminded me, of being the first public lending library. And with that, it really sets the stage to where, we, where we've gone, as we all know that Reverend Embens basically took those books and had stored them in his barn. Of course, you had to be a member of his congregation to get access to them. That presented a problem for the people. Um, shortly after that, around 1778, um, the townspeople, in following what Ben's request was, was to be able to, oh, please come in, please come in, to following Ben's request in order to make those books available to everybody. And certainly, one of those uh, people who I have so much admiration for is um, Horace Mann, who is the father of education. Um, word has it that Horace Mann probably read many of those books, though he wasn't always in particularly agreement with all of them. Um, and one of the things that um, he went on to is uh, became the president of Antioch College. Um, he also was a politician. Uh, a writer, it's just a remarkable, remarkable influence across America. Um, and again, with that, uh, around the 1858, when um, essentially the town took over and started what was not, wasn't formally incorporated, but was the Franklin Library Association. And essentially they took charge of those books to preserve and protect them so that people would have access to these. And so that was kind of the early beginning. And it's, it's interesting. There was so much thought uh, in organization in putting together the, this particular book. In our original book, the leather-bound book, they're writing out all the <clears throat> all the articles that will be in terms of the bylaws, how will we operate, um, how will we set forth in terms of its operations. It was so well thought out um, and so clearly written. Um, I was, I'm always impressed with the amount of detail and effort 
that was put forth by all the early um, board members of the Franklin Library Association. Again, this is where it gets, where we come in. So in October of 1872, um, that's where the Franklin Library Association um, essentially made it to incorporate. And so that's where essentially if you <clears throat> try to bring together how did that fit into today, that's where today we would have started a nonprofit organization. And so the association became that organization really founded to serve the community <clears throat> and taking those, you know, the funds that they had at the time to begin to turn that around and, you know, provide services in terms of making books available um, and providing, hiring a librarian. It is just remarkable of how they started in terms of and then gathering funds and gathering support through the community uh, to begin to put together the building of the Ray Memorial Library. So fast forward to where we're at now. <clears throat> 1872, <clears throat> they gather up the funds, they put together a, a committee, a group of people, and plan out how do we put together the library. Um, and I can't say enough about our library working with Felicia and working with the board of directors and the friends and many other people that have been committed to this just wonderful library. What an absolute piece of history we are so fortunate to have in our town. Uh, one of the things that we were very fortunate in carrying on, and I know that speaking for myself and all of our board members was a commitment to preservation and to restoration of the artifacts, to the uh, paintings. It's just, and, and I would encourage each and every one of you, and for those that get to watch this at a later date, uh, our library is really like a museum. It truly is a piece of history. Um, and the stories that it tells are just reflect so much of um, American history and how, and how America itself started. So with 1872 and moving forward, in 1904, the, the Ray Memorial Library opened its doors. Um, there's just a rich history of all the people involved in terms of the painting. And interestingly enough, I don't know what that figure would be today, but I know that in 1904, it cost $200,000 to build this library. I can't even fathom what that would cost today. Um, and interestingly enough, when I was reading about the building of the Ray Memorial Library, they also had supply issues, by the way. <laughs> yeah, they were, things got delayed in terms of being able to get supplies and so on. Um, <clears throat> so with that, we, we just, uh, within our, our book, we just cover all the different histories of the different decades through the Franklin Library. And probably one of the other turning points was around March of 1982 where essentially the cost of running the library had just become really too much for the Ray Memorial to, to continue with that. Um, and so essentially the town graciously took over and working in collaboration with the Franklin Library Association began to operate the library. Um, and with that, the town also funded the library. So again, we see this commitment of, of continuing this institution. And one of the things that comes out in all the writings um, of our predecessors in terms of when you look at the wills of the, um, the, the, the Ray sisters or Oliver Dean, there was just this ongoing commitment to say, how can we preserve this and make this available for the future? Um, again, the 1990s moved to the preservation and moving funds to the, Frank, the Franklin Library Association. Um, the Friends takes a, a more active role to expand programs and museum passes. Um, and certainly, I think one of the things that, just to share a little bit, I didn't come aboard, I wasn't elected president until 2007. But one of the things that really was remarkable from 1994 to roughly 2004 
The Library Association was in a time of challenge um, for a variety of reasons. And, you know, there was talk at one point that the Library Association could have been essentially sunsetted at that point in time. And so when I honor some of those people uh, mentioned earlier, it's just remarkable that for some reason nobody took any action on that and they just kept it running. Um, and though there was a period of time uh, from 1994 to 2004 where there wasn't a lot going on, we really start coming out of the gate in around 2003, 2004. And it's just one of the things I would just like to share is um, certainly with the many people that came before me and with our group that started, uh, I came aboard around 2006, 2007. From that point forward, we were really able to create an organization with transparency, um, building relationships with the library, building relationships with the town. And so today, this organization has contributed over $550,000 to the preservation and restoration of this library through its sound investments, through its transparency, um, to our board that just was able to move things forward. And one of the things I would just like to call your attention to, interestingly enough too, as we all know, probably one of the, the pandemic was probably one of the most challenging times for all of us. Um, but I have to say for this library association, um, the start of, at the start of that pandemic, um, we had just made tremendous gains in terms of restoration of paintings. Um, we were able to uh, work with Rocco Cavallaro to build a podium. If you go up into the delivery room, there's a book there that talks about Ben Franklin's letter. It's just a beautiful, beautiful piece of nostalgia. We were able to get um, basically a, a very well-designed, controlled bookcase to preserve Ben Franklin's books. Um, we also, again, to the Ray sisters, uh, if you come in the front entrance way, there's just a beautiful, beautiful hand-built mahogany podium that holds the, basically telling the story of how the Franklin Library started. Um, it's just, that there's been some really wonderful pieces that have been added to this. Um, I think one of the other things that <clears throat> I would just like to add, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the association also had taken a very, uh, has been just very active in this community. Um, and I really think I speak very clearly and on behalf of all our board members that this has really been an honor um, to serve this community, to be able to use these funds as our, our, our forefathers say in all their writings, to use them prudently and to use them to fulfill the mission in which their, their goal was to continue this library to move forward in perpetuity. And I think we have done that. Uh, and I think we've done it quietly, but we've done it so that when you walk through this library, you can see the very, the, 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 um, the work that was done, the effort that was put in for the restoration of paintings, um, and, and other things within this library. One of the things I wanted to do right now, I would like to ask um, President Kenneth Elmore if you would come up here for a minute. It's very nice to meet Me you. too. President Elmore, one of the things that I we want. not in trouble or anything. You were not in trouble. We've heard you've been doing a very good job. Oh, wow. One of the things that we wanted to present to you um, that really talks about the relationship with Oliver Dean to this library on behalf of the Franklin Public Library and the Franklin Library Association, we would like to give you this leather bound copy of the history of the Franklin Thank Library. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Wow. Thank awesome. you. So you, you now have a piece of history. This is great. I read a bootlegged copy this weekend. So <laughs> but now you have your own. This is awesome. Thank and, you so much. And your bookmark is there so you don't lose your place. Oh, wow. This is great. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. 
And before closing, I would just like to say a special thanks to Emma McCarthy Earls and Ellen R. R. Earls, our co-editors of this just wonderful, wonderful work of history. Uh, thank you, Ellen, for taking my many phone calls, emails, um, last-minute suggestions and ideas, and also to our board of directors, um, Armin Fernandez, Edward Padden, Nancy Rappa, Beth Muccheroni, Greg Del Rocco, Mary Jane Witten, Shirley Baruso, and Joan McGuire, um, who this amazing team, we could have never just made the, 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 the goals that we had set for. Um, I just, it has really been quite, quite a journey. And I think one of the things for me is that um, when I talk about, when I think about the Franklin Library Association, um, it has been a great teacher to me in history. I've had the privilege of reading letters written by Horace Mann. Um, I've gotten to read the book of all the entries of the people that have come before me and the minutes and the, the works that people had done. And I think that our early board members would have been proud of what we were able to do um, in telling their story and certainly in carrying forward just the many good works that I don't think anybody could have envisioned. I don't think they could have ever envisioned that we would be video recorded right now or that we would have computers that would type up our stories, um, you know, that our books would now be online as well as available through a library. Um, it just talks of how much we've come forward in this fast-moving world in which we live in. So with that, what I'd like to do is um, turn over to our panelists and let me just give me one second here to I am honored <coughs> to have our panelists here tonight <coughs> and At this important moment in our history, I thought it would be important to have this program look at where the library and the nation have come and how libraries have helped shape and strengthen our democratic institutions and how they can and should evolve in our changing world. So with that, let me introduce you to our panelists. First, I'd like to introduce Patricia St. Aubin, who holds a BS in accounting and a master's in American history from Providence College. Currently, St. Aubin is completing a PhD in humanities with a concentration on colonial province. The 25 years leading up to the American Revolution at Salve Regina University. Her research has included studies of the Providence Library Company, 1753, and was influenced by J Benjamin Franklin's creation of the Library Company of Philadelphia, 1731. St. Aubin has previously worked in Boston's financial district in banking, insurance, and healthcare, and she lives in Norfolk. Next to her is James C. Johnston, Jr., who's earned his BA and master's degree in history from Bridgewater State University and was a high school teacher for over 30 years. He's written for several local publications, including the Regional Recorder, the Milford Daily News, and the Franklin Observer. He currently lives on the historic Oliver Pond House of 1760 in Franklin and is a former selectman and chair of the town's 1978 Bicentennial Commission. He is the author of several books, including Odyssey in the Wilderness, A History of Franklin, Massachusetts, 1978, Images of America, Franklin Arcadia, 1996, The Yankee Fleet, Maritime New England and the Age of Sail in 2007, and The African Sun, which was a fiction novel in 2011. And then following Mr. Johnson is Robert A. Lawson with a PhD in Vanderbilt from 2003. He's a professor of history and the director of the honors program at Dean College. His signature work is in Jim Crow's Counterculture the Blues and Black Southerners of 1890 to 1945, which won the Gulf South Historical Association's Thomason Prize for the Book of the Year 
in 2011. So if you would, please, let's give them a warm welcome. So how I'd like to design this <clears throat> is um, I would ask each of our speakers to um, limit their comments to about 10 minutes. And what I, what I would like to do is also offer a moment if any of our speakers wanted to make a comment or anything about the particular questions that we've selected. And one of the things that we'd like to allot some time for at the end is um, to provide people in our audience an opportunity to um, ask some questions as well. So participation is encouraged. So Patricia, let me start off with you, please. You have looked at the founding and development of the Providence Library Association, which, which later became the nucleus of the Providence Athenaeum, still with us today. What could you tell us about the state of libraries in America in those early years as people like Franklin helped to encourage the creation of very subscription libraries? And what was the relationship of those libraries to new ideas about America and expanding democracy? Thank you, Scott. This is right up my alley for information. Um, Alan, I have a handout maybe if you could do that, please. And I just want to take a moment not with my 10 minutes, to thank you, Scott, to thank the association, the president, Alan Earls, who asked me to participate in this, and all of you that have come here tonight um, to listen and to garner some knowledge about our subject matter libraries. But thank you so much for being here, and thank you for asking me to participate. I do live in the next town over, but I've always admired this library, and the connection with Ben Franklin is just terrific, so thank you. Um, yes, so my um, thesis is on the Providence Library Company, the 25 years leading up to the American Revolution, and what exactly was that library doing? And what were other subscription libraries doing in that time frame? So um, Franklin's Library, the Philadelphia Library Company, um, of Philadelphia was established in 1731 and he chose certain books for that library. All along the way there were other um, cities in the colonies that were also establishing subscription libraries at the same time. Um, Boston did, Philadelphia did obviously, Newport did with the Redwood Library, the Boston Athenaeum is the one in Boston, Charleston, South Carolina, and what do all those cities have in common? Well, they were all seaports. And that's where the wealth was coming from. They were developing with population and so forth and so on, um, all the appearances of becoming more cities than actually becoming towns. Providence had been very rural when it was first established. And if you look at a map of Providence and how the original founders, it was laid out on what is now North and South Main Street, but it was called Town Street at the time. And they had these thin spigots of land that ran up to what is Benefit Street and up to Brown right now. Um, Benefit Street was then Back Street, which was developed also in the 1700s. But they farmed back there, they buried their um, loved ones back there, and as the town grew, um, it became more commercial. And so about this time, you have to understand that Newport was really the key center of the colony of Rhode Island. And Newport had access to the ocean, they had the sea trade going on, and in about the 1730s, the Browns and a few others decided, hey, let's give Newport a run for their money. And so they did. They were on the Narragansett Bay, and they started developing wharfs, wharves in downtown Providence. Town Street, you know, became more commercialized. And along with this whole um, time frame of trying to beat out Newport, you might remember the Hopkins Ward controversy, which lasted for about 12 years, right in the middle of all this, and Stephen Hopkins and Samuel Ward were going back and forth as the colonial governor of um, the colony. And so all these people, and it was mostly men, unfortunately, at this time, they were the merchants, they had the money, they were gathering together, and they were saying to themselves, how can we compete with Newport and become the entrepot of the colony. 
and it was through civic-minded activities. And one of the first things that they decided to do was to copy Benjamin Franklin and to copy the Redwood Library and establish their own library in 1753, which became known as the Providence Library Company. And so they did this um, to expand their wealth, to expand their knowledge, to read about history, to understand their human condition and where they were, and you know how to progress. This was all a part of their progression to become a leader, to ultimately have the college in Providence, which was called Rhode Island College before it was called Brown. The Browns donated land, and that's how it became known as Brown University. But it was called Rhode Island College. And that was another fight, trying to get the college in which of these two cities. But as you realize, Providence ultimately won out. So. They put together in 1754 a book committee, just like what you said happened here. And um, they ordered books from London. And you might remember that books were very expensive in the 1700s. We didn't have print shops here. Everything had to be shipped and come over from England or from France, very expensive. So where subscription libraries came from is the financial resources that each individual had. If they put up 20 pounds, um, they could do better by the number of books that they could buy than if they were buying them individually. So that's where the subscription library concept came from. It was pooling financial resources together so that they could buy more books. The Providence Library Company actually was able to buy 345 books in 1754, and that became the catalog of 1755 because it took a while for those books to come across the sea, and you had to hope and pray that they came over safely and that that ship didn't um, sink on the way over. Um, but what I handed out um, is the Providence Library Company of 1753. The ones that are checked off are the same books that Benjamin Franklin, you know, bought for your library 35 years later in 1786. So you can see that there are a lot of works that are very similar in nature. And what is interesting to me with my research, what is the colony of, Pro of Rhode Island known for? It took in a lot of religious zealots and people that got kicked out of Massachusetts, from Plymouth, from Boston, from Salem. They all ended up in Rhode Island. But ironically, the Providence Library was very um, low on its inventory of books on theology which sort of is inquisitive to me. But they really had a lot of books on history, and they had books about Locke and Montesquieu. They had Machiavelli. Um, they wanted to, you know, Bolingbroke. They wanted to advance themselves and understand where they were. Ultimately, all these books and why these books were important, they had thoughts in their head about becoming free people. How were they going to brush off the yoke of the crown? Again, we're in a trading community. They're starting to become wealthy individuals. And they didn't want somebody an ocean away dictating to them how they were going to live their lives. So one of the ways was knowledge, useful knowledge, which is what all these, all these libraries um, you know, enacted. Shortly over time, the subscription library, like your library, yeah. with your minister, who wanted to keep the books in his barn, and you, as a town, decided that everyone should have access to these books. Well, the Providence Library wrote in a few l rules after a short period of time. Initially, they decided to open them up to the General Assembly, which is their state, their colonial legislature. And they still call it that down there, the General Assembly. Well, why? Because they were storing the books in the townhouse where the General Assembly um, resided and conducted business. So I guess in their leisure time, they felt it was fair they should have access to the books. It does seem fair to me. Um, secondarily, they allowed the books to be offered to the clergy in the town, the ministers. Again, how useful knowledge being expounded from the pulpit. And lastly, once they developed a school or two, they allowed the schoolmasters in Providence to have access to these books. It wasn't until much later, when public libraries you know, became more the norm, that they opened up their subscription library to more than just the select few. But 
Um, I also wrote down about Carl Brindenbar. If anybody wants to read about this particular time frame and what the country was experiencing, what America was going through, Carl has, he's dead now, but in, seven, in 1938 and 1955, he wrote two books. Um, he wrote Cities in the Wilderness and then his follow-up book, Cities in Revolt. And it's all about this time frame and how we as Americans were becoming, you know, free people, how we were deciding to create revolutionary thoughts, how we were acting against the Stamp and Sugar Act, and how these books were formulating thoughts and ideas, not just in discussion, but in writings, too. Stephen Hopkins was a you know, very good writer. He wrote in the local newspaper. He wrote a remonstrance back to the Crown, stating all the reasons why what they were doing with trade and trying to, you know, garnish their own um, money off of the trade that the Americas were doing was just unfair. So um, they were becoming free people. Also, in the second book that um, Carl Brindenbar wrote, uh, he talked about that he felt the seeds of Americanism were already beginning in this country in the 1700s, the mid-1700s. We were developing our own culture, our own way of looking at things, our own way of wanting to progress with our own lives. You may remember that de Tocqueville came to this country in 18, early 1830s, and his book of 1835, Democracy in America, was exactly that, his observations of how we as Americans looked at things in a certain way. So Carl Brindenbar argues that this was already, the seeds of this were already in place in the 1750s forward, primarily because of what we were reading. So in conclusion, um, the Providence Library contributed to this new American outlook with its book. Many of the ideas derived from the library held at the Providence Library um, Company were discussed at home, were discussed in workplaces, and in those days in taverns. And I think similarly, we do things similar today with book clubs, with taking classes, with sharing a book with a spouse or a partner. And the Providence Library's companies um, opened up its citizens and minds to new thoughts and ideas which fostered an ideological underpinning of the American Revolution. The present-day Benefit Street Providence Athenaeum still holds its roots as a subscription library. I am a member of the Providence Athenaeum. I'm also a member of the Boston Athenaeum, which is up near the State House, Kitty Corner, across the street. Both of these facilities, although they're subscription libraries, and the Redwood Library, too, they are open to the public. You can get in, and um, in the Boston Athenaeum, you can get in on the first floor, but they are beautiful institutions, much like this when you talked about the artwork and whatnot. Athenaeums are just not a library. They are also museums on some level. I would encourage you to take a ride down to Providence and take a look inside the Providence Athenaeum, which is what is the outgrowth of the Providence Library Company. I walked in that building, and that's how I ended up writing some um, my thesis, basically, um, on the books that are held, were held there in the 1750s. Um, it's an exploration of consciousness. That's what books do for us. It's a common need for social education and community interaction. That's what books do for us. We are lucky enough to live in a time where public libraries do this. This library being the first in the nation as a public library. What a proud legacy the town of Franklin holds. So thank you so much for your time, and I appreciate your listening and being interested. Thank you. Thank you. Go on to uh, Jim Johnston. As usual, I prepared my lecture as I entered the door tonight. <laughs> and I took advantage of the last 10 minutes to make some notes here and there. As sparks were struck, sparks were struck right in front of you. Sparks of intellect, and I'm sure you didn't miss any of them. <clears throat> I, am, uh, I often think about a question I've been asked and that is, if you could encounter anybody from history and spend an afternoon with them, who would it be? 
Well, you know something, I'm a greedy guy. <laughs> I'm not gonna be satisfied with one. But at the top of my list would be Benjamin Franklin. Absolutely no question about that whatsoever. Now, <clears throat> his acquaintanceship with libraries began probably when he went to Boston Latin for a year before his father took him out and put him to work as a chandler in his uh, candle making operation. And no doubt he was deeply inspired by what he had been exposed to because pretty soon he began writing some pretty powerful stuff. And his brother James, to whom he was apprenticed later on as a printer, uh, put him in charge of his uh, operation while he actually spent some time as the guest of the governor of Massachusetts in the uh, jails of the Commonwealth because uh, he did not uh, publish, because he published something with which the governor had disagreed. Well, uh, Franklin got away with writing things in the paper for which his brother had actually been in prison for writing similar things. But he wrote them, he wrote them as an elderly woman expressing her opinions, which were exactly the same opinions being expressed by James Franklin. But his subterfuge worked, and he got away with it as silence do good. Now, at this table of mine, along with Ben Franklin, I'd have uh, Roger Williams, who perhaps was the towering intellectual of his day. You know what I admire about Williams? besides the founding of Rhode Island, our sister colony next door. That is that he knew everybody worth knowing. He absolutely did, and he interacted with them. Blackstone and revising law, he was a secretary. Uh, the greatest intellectuals of England were people that he actually talked to. It was amazing, he even disputed with James I of England, who was a rather dour Scot, who nevertheless had a very high IQ and a great ability to write and express himself. So uh, he was a man of scholarship who found equality with Native Americans and found equality among people of all religious persuasions even atheists. <laughs> Rhode Island was the only place in the New World in which atheists were embraced. Thomas Jefferson would be at my table, and sitting next to him would be Abigail Adams. Her letters to her husband are not only poignant, they are also frequently well-reasoned arguments and don't forget the ladies, she admonished her husband, as you consider the great questions of shaping this republic. And of course, Horace Mann would be there. I would definitely want Horace Mann there. Horace Mann opened Oberlin to Native Americans, to women, to people of color, to Anybody seeking an education, they were welcomed at Oberlin on an equal basis. That is absolutely titanic, and that's why he earned a seat at my table. Frederick Douglass, and I am very lucky to own some first editions of his autobiographies, and reading him as he was first published will reveal to you a genius a self-educated genius who knew how to express himself in a manner which was exciting, exciting and riveting, holding of your attention. It was wonderful reading him. And of course, why not invite in Sojourner Truth, 
why not invite in Harriet Tubman, two of his contemporaries who were not great literary figures, but their personal histories speak volumes about them and the hopes and aspirations not only of black Americans, but what should be the hopes and aspirations of all Americans. This would be an exciting table. And we'll set it right here in Franklin. <laughs> and we'll invite those people here, and we will have them to dinner. Now, when you were mentioning Alexis de Tocqueville, which came to mind is something he said about Americans, which I think rings very true. He said, every single American, all Americans have watches. Every American's got a watch. They're not very good watches, but everybody's got one. You know, and there's something about that. And he, I don't think he's really talking about watches in every case, you know? We were sharing something. We were sharing a marvelous experiment, a fabulous experiment, of which this man was one of his fathers. Here is Le Bonhomme Richard himself. Here he is in his fur hat. He showed up at the most glorious, most glittering court in Europe, the court of Louis XVI, absolutely glittering with the brightest personalities, some of the most brilliant minds, and certainly some of the most dazzlingly attired people in his fur hat and his hair hanging about his shoulders in a uh, sort of fur collared coat. And they all wanted to meet Le Docteur Franklin. Voltaire clung to life so he could meet Dr. Franklin. My God, Voltaire, what better what better fan can you have than Voltaire? So anyway, Franklin is amazing for so many things. And people may forget the Albany Plan of Union and all of that early stuff. But he was a man who saw the possibilities of freedom, the functionality of a functioning post office throughout the colonies. And when the United States government in 1847 issued its very first postage stamp. Who was pictured thereon? Come back here. <laughs> Dr. Franklin, that's who. And uh, I will invite you up here afterwards where I will supervise the turning of the pages. <laughs> where I will allow you to see the original Franklin and Washington stamps of 1847 wow. for yourself. Stamps are going up on the 22nd. <laughs> <laughs> Buy forever stamps and it's not a problem. <laughs> All right, now, one of my early students, come forth, I need you. Uh -oh. Well, I got lots of early students here. One of you come up here. You, young lady, you may show Dr. Franklin on, in this Aglamese portrait, which dates from shortly after his death. Now, Franklin was so popular, he was even, just show it to the people, yeah, take it around there. That, that's good. Banner wipe. That's good. <laughs> now, these are my former students. I know. So, these, are, these young people are, are very good. You know something I taught? I taught 10, over 10,000 young people at Franklin during my career. I would have done it for nothing. It was the most rewarding thing I ever did to the nicest people I ever met, my students and their wonderful families. You know, I look at Vicki Bashanio Earls there, and one of my kids, and others of my kids over here. Not one of my kids, but I had your kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Franklin was such a popular figure that books like this were published, and this, by the way, is his autobiography. And how late were they reading his autobiography? Well, in 1835, this was a bestseller. And this book is called a coaching book, because you could put it in your pocket, take it on a coach ride, and you could read, if you could read 
the smallest type I've ever seen in my life. Can you, can you imagine setting this type? No. Could you imagine setting that type almost 200? I'd have to be able to read it first. I mean, that's... <laughs> that's pretty small. No wonder people went blind. <laughs> but, you know, coaching books of, uh, of his life. You know, I am sure there are places in this country, I'm not going to say geographically where, but I think we know, where this book is banned because of its contents. And a lot of it was practical advice. For instance, if a man would have his, a young man would have his first amorous experience, Franklin wrote, it should be with a much older woman. Because if they are discovered, she will be looked upon for her generosity in teaching this young man <laughs> and taking him under her wing. And I, I think that this is wonderful practical advice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and probably still has validity. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. And, but uh, Dr. Franklin was an amazing man. And Horace Mann was an amazing man. And even in his way, Dr. Emmons was a somewhat amazing man. <laughs> At least he had a sort of sense of humor, and that shall be the topic of another lecture. But uh, all I can say in uh, conclusion is, I'm sure that libraries, whether they're close guarded and kept to members of an exclusive group, as Emmons would have seen to have done, are open to free associations, and most grandly open to the public as Joseph Gordon Ray did in his work with the Franklin Library Association, and who, by the way, was at the opening of every library, it seems, everywhere in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, including the library in the town of Bridgewater, where his name appears in the guest book very prominently. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just amazing to think of what the impact of the whole idea of the library has had upon these communities. It was a place to uplift the spirit, to expose people. It certainly was a great leveler, and it certainly was among the best gifts toward a growing and burgeoning democracy. Dr. Lawson, you have your own breadth of interests, but many of them are more contemporary, and significantly, you are now teaching the newest generation of students. What can we say about the role of libraries in 20th century America and across racial and ethnic lines? What is the legacy of libraries, and where or what are we evolving towards? Will knowledge be redu reduced to an app, or is there a role for stewardship? a public space for learning and culture. Thank you, Scott. And uh, wow, listening to Patricia and Jim, I was transported back to a moment, the vice presidential debate of 1992, where some of you might remember Admiral Stockdale saying, who am I? Why am I here? <laughs> And I say that because I'm sitting next to a historian of libra libraries and, and a, a real historian of, of Franklin. And uh, I'm a relative newcomer to this community. I've been here 20 years, but uh, um, I just have to say I'm honored to be here. And thanks, Alan, for the invitation. And thanks, uh, Scott, for hosting us. And thanks, everyone, for being here. So um, yes. There is a place uh, for libraries, and as I prepared for tonight, I thought about what are libraries in this changing time? What have they been? Uh, what are they now? What might they be? Uh, I'm really, really uh, privileged and happy in that my uh, office uh, for the last almost 20 years has been in a library, <laughs> the one right across the street. Uh, we haven't too many books in there right now, which is uh, kind of an issue, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, but um, I was so pleased uh, to 
listened to my colleagues here on the panel talk about Tocqueville, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, and, uh, or when I was in the South, people pronounced it Tocqueville, and you can say it however you like. But there was something that he wrote in that, how many of her pages is democracy in America? It's a pretty, <laughs> a pretty thick tome. And it brings us back to this moment. And it's, the, it's probably the most salient point uh, that he made in the, whole, uh, in the whole writing. And he said, you know, in, in France and in Europe, if there's something that the community needs, the people will get together and they will go to the manor, to the nobleman, and they'll say, we have this issue, we want you to solve it. He said, it's not like that in America. In America, if there's an issue, the people will get together and they'll form an association and they'll solve it. And this library association is one of hundreds of thousands of examples of that American spirit, that democratic spirit, to not look to someone else for our uh, betterment, but to better ourselves. And so uh, it's, it, that is a wonderful uh, 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 chord, I think, to, to strike here. And uh, also a reminder that um, almost 200 years later, Tocqueville is relevant to us. And um, I'm not suggesting that everyone go out and, and read it all. Uh, maybe no, some have more free time. Read it all. Read it all. <laughs> you should. You really should. Jim's right. Uh, <laughs> read them both. Anyway. Read them. Yeah, it's it is relevant. But um, but I do you know that I am uh, now 20 years almost, or I guess at this point at Dean, and have worked with an interesting collection uh, of students, and I really appreciated what Jim had to say about the the importance of the students and their families in our lives when you work with them. And uh, I, I, I echo that. It's been a transition period uh, from, you know, even in my undergrad days when we were using the card catalog and you'd go in and that big wooden drawer and start going through. And to see how, uh, how I mentor, uh, and yes, how I'm mentoring students in their work in our library today, it has been a, a pretty, um, it has been a pretty tremendous uh, transition. But I reflected on what libraries have meant to me, and I think that that's a fruitful recollection because as we imagine what libraries are and what they will be, perhaps some of these fundamental principles will still carry forward. Well, the first thing is, I think libraries are a wonderful place for children. And I think they should remain wonderful places for children. When I was uh, very young in a community far, far away, same galaxy, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, had a, we had a sign at the park, the public park, and it was not far from the public library, and it said, through these gates walk our future leaders. And as a we person, I didn't really know what to make of all of that. I thought, oh, someone here is going to be a leader. <laughs> I didn't think it would be me. I'm, but it was inspiring. It was inspiring. Um, the library had a place for children to be children. It had a place for our parents and our teachers and our uh, adult community members to, to mentor us and teach us. But it also had things like games and furniture that you could play on. And I thought that was really important because that was something that made the library attractive to me as a child. And then I started to find other things at the library that were really attractive to me. Um, I don't know about all of you, but in my community, we had something called uh, RIF, Reading is Fundamental. And the library was the place that we went. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the program, it was um, uh, a community program that was designed to get books in the hands of children. And I used to love the Rift days because you could go and they had tables like this and they were covered in books and you could pick the ones that you wanted. 
And so there was an agency to it. Uh, there was an individual, uh, individual aspect to it. Uh, there was a very childlike fascination to it. But it was also an older generation handing us something that they thought we might want. And some of those books remain very uh, dear to me. Whoever put the Neville shoot on the beach on the table for the second graders, that probably, I wasn't really ready for that. I don't know if any of you have read that. This is a nuclear apocalyptic book. But anyway, it took me a while to figure it out, but I had it as of second grade. <laughs> and then thinking, and then getting a little older and going to um, a, a large city uh, public library where they had the book sale. And in the basement of the library, going and, and rifling through audiobooks, which my mother was really, really into. And I picked up a book that um, probably wouldn't be published under the same title today, but it dated from the 40s, and it was called The History of the Orient. And it was, as you might guess, Asian history, East Asian history. I carried that book with me whenever I went backpacking. I was a Boy Scout. And I always took that book with me because I thought, oh, one of these times I'm going to read this. And if I take it out camping, I can read it in my tent or I could read it by the fireside. And as an older book, it was really quite heavy. Uh, it was not printed on light, you know, pocketbook paper. I've carried that book so many places. I haven't read that much of it, but I still intend to read it. But it reminds me of that fascination with things that might be far away from you and that this is something that, that books do. Later, I found myself going to libraries, uh, university libraries, when I wanted to uh, study historical recipes. I'm really into food and culinary history and food ways history. And I remember as a young person going to a state university and asking for uh, books in the historical recipe collection and trying to look really serious, like I wasn't just here to like get the recipe, like I was there for a more important like scholarly reason. I was really just trying to find old recipes. Libraries do all of these things. I, um, my world was opened up by libraries. And this is something that we do need to think about with, um, with all of us today, because I mean, I think most people here have a smartphone. Um, but you know, especially the younger people for whom this is the world that they know. And when I could go to the library as a teenager and look in the phone books of the different places I wanted to go live or that I was planning to go live, and look at city street maps. And again, we, you know, I think I'm looking around, I think we all kind of remember that <laughs> when you didn't just get it on the phone and you went to the library and you discovered the world that was available and the imagination, those things inside you that maybe weren't being, uh, you know, that you didn't see support or, 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 or structure to, to lift up, but you could go to the library and there you found that validation. There you were reminded that your wild and crazy dreams of youth were not just uh, fanciful imaginations. They could, they could become real because there were tangible things at the library, things you could hold in your hand that connected you to those things. And this is something that we have to remember. I worked as a, uh, I don't know what the technical term is. Uh, I called it a shelver. I had a job in grad school where my, my job was every morning to go to the circulation desk and get the big cart. And they were amazing because they never checked in on you. <laughs> you, you just got the cart and you were supposed to go shelve the books that had come back through circulation. They never checked to see what we were doing or how many carts did you reshelve that day or quotas. Because frankly, I would just take the cart and, and lose myself. What were other people reading? Wow, you know, I was a history graduate student. I was very, very narrow in my work, but I got exposed to all kinds of things, like learning about plants in the Pacific Islands and learning about uh, early modern artists and, and, and um, lithograph makers who I had never known. I mean, things that really actually changed my life and it changed the direction of my life because I had to reshelve a random book. So I could go on. <laughs> 
There are libraries where we go and we connect. The Schomburg Center, the, the New York Public Library branch in Harlem, go there and see the Aaron Douglas murals and, and commune with Langston Hughes. Um, the library here is like that because it connects us to, to also amazing people who have their histories. Um, go to the Trinity Library in Dublin and, and, and go into an architectural space where the books are part of the, yeah, part of that physical material space. So libraries do a lot of things. As I mentioned at the top, I work in a building that is called the Library Learning Commons. We haven't really got many books in it, but some of these things still very tangibly happen there in the sense that students can go and find horizons that they didn't even know were horizons. As long as we make sure that our libraries, and this one is in great shape. <laughs> this one, is, this one is, is a destination library. This is a library that, uh, as a, as a non-native to the, to the community, I can say, wow, what a, what a treasure, what a legacy, what a heritage, what a, uh, uh, what a resource to preserve for the future. And the acknowledgement that exists, you know, I think all of us who are historians know, um, we know very deeply that we don't do history uh, for the sake of the past. We do history for ourselves. We do history for those who will come after us. So congratulations to, to the, um, the FLA and, and um, Alan and Eamon as the chief editors here of producing this history. So we just have to keep in mind, what are libraries for? Um, and what kind of imaginations uh, can be sparked there? What kind of new horizons can be found there? Uh, what kind of uh, meeting points? Because I remember the people that would help you out. Mm -hmm. And we still do a lot of that. And even if it's on a computer or it's on an app, the young people still need help. And they need a kind person next to them to help them navigate, to help them find new horizons. And regardless of how many books there are, and I think there always need to be books because there's nothing like holding them, and I think we all understand the, the, tangible, um, the tangible appeal. Um, but I think what's more important that, than that is that there need to be people together uh, there need to be people together. And perhaps the fewer books, the more people, even. Uh, because that's what we do every day uh, across the street at, at Dean. And I love that my office is in the library um, because it is a place where I get to meet people, I get to share my passion with them, and I get to listen to what they're passionate about. And that's the old just walk down the aisle and look at the books. Mm -hmm. Because you'll find things that you don't know are there. So let's reflect on what libraries have been for each and every one of us and find our own individual ways to give that joy uh, and that power to the next generation. Um, and I think if we do that, then the work of the Franklin Library Association will be uh, kept on in its spirit. And I will say, I am a, a very fortunate person in that I get to help welcome uh, hundreds of new people to this community every year in my role as a professor of history and director of the honors program. I get to meet the, the many, mostly 18-year-olds, that many of whom are coming to Franklin for the first time. And I bring them here to this library. And we go in, and they are fascinated. They are awed and they make documentary films about it <laughs> when they show up on time. <laughs> they do their best. <laughs> they make documentary films about it. They write essays about it. They talk about it. They share it with their friends. This is a beautiful library. I'm really happy to be part of this tonight. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Franklin Library Association and the Franklin Public Library, this has just been a wonderful, wonderful discussion of history to Patricia, to John, to you, Robert. 
this has just been a wonderful, wonderful presentation of learning more about the library. And one of the things that listening to you talk about it, and, and particularly about libraries, and I remember um, my mother bringing me to uh, our first local, the Silas Bronson Library in Waterbury, Connecticut. Um, and I was just mesmerized with all the books and the carts and the Dewey Decimal System and how to find different books. And one of the things that, and just listening to you, is I'd be interested to hear how, how you all might think about how, does, how, how do you believe that higher education really fits into this modern library, given the rapid changes? For example, we look at online education or with learning platforms and open educational resources now. So you can get books online, you can get journal articles online. And one of the things that really spoke to me is when we talk about the history of holding books and th there's nothing like being able to hold a book in your hand. How do you think we can promote that more as we, as we look to the next generation of new students and another generation of trying to blend in the modern of when we're, we're so technologically advanced, but still having that ability to go into a library and find something new or a, or a different perspective on what we may be learning. What are your thoughts on that? Patricia? Um, well, I, I think that um, there was a phase when people were on their nook or whatever. Yes. Uh, some of us never did that. Some of us always liked to physically hold a book. I myself like to write in books. And um, when I look at some of the books that are still with the Providence Athenaeum, that, are, that I go into the rare book room and I'm allowed to look at them, um, there are notations. There's edits on the side. Um, some of the Browns, Moses Brown was big on making corrections. Even when they were in Latin, he would <laughs> correct, you know, some of the books and it was in the wrong tense and he would make that notation. Um, but the Nook thing sort of was, everyone was doing that for a while and then everybody came back to books again. Um, and some of the you know, bookstores have gone out. Some of the big ones have gone out, or Barnes and Noble has co consolidated. Um, what's the one, Ralph, that you like down in Mansfield? Borders, Borders, Borders book. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, they went out. But if you look at the small independent um, bookstores, there's a nice one in Wayland Square in Providence. Um, we have the one in Plainville that opened up recently. Um, I think people still enjoy books, and I, I hope young people do. If I, I'm on a plane or a train or whatnot, it does seem like young people are holding books like we always did. And so I'm not so sure that um, the tablet thing is for everybody. And I, I think it's convenient to store things there, but at the end of the day, it's just nice to know that you're turning a page. Thanks. And I, and I hope others feel the same way and encourage that. Thank you. Jim, what are your thoughts? When I was a kid, I, I was once a kid, by the way, <laughs> but back when I was in, say, junior high school, one of the things I used to love to do in the summertime was come into this building. And uh, Miss Holmes, who was the librarian in those days, would allow me a very, very, very rare privilege. I could go up, not to the glass bottom floor, I could go up to the floor above that. I could go into what was virtually the attic. And in the attic of this building were the most marvelous things, magazines, bound, leather-bound magazines going back into the, into the 18th century. And there I could just sit and read all afternoon. I could be up there for three hours, four hours, until they, you know, declawed me from the <laughs> magazines and the books and dragged me out so I could go home for dinner. 
But I, I had a wonderful time in this building. I had a terrific time in this building. It was a, I mean, she knew I had a special affinity for this material. And she just let me indulge it. And I don't know, I don't know personally anybody else who ever did that. I don't know if anybody else who ever did that or was allowed to do it. But the thing is, I, I didn't push the privilege uh, to the point of ad nauseum. Well, maybe I did. I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I did go over the edge a bit. But going over the edge is what I've been doing all my life. For almost 80 years, I've been going over the edge, and I've loved the trip. <laughs> it's a wonderful trip over the edge. I recommend you all do it two or three times at some point in your life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Rob, your thoughts? Well, one of the things that's great about libraries traditionally, um, and this certainly was the case at Dean and many other libraries, when you would get a book and you would look back to the little sleeve with the circulation card, oh, yeah. and you could see uh, other people that had checked the book out. Now, I know with the Patriot Act and after September 11th, that was something we weren't supposed to do so much anymore, but that was a very digital age thing. But the idea that still, you know other people had also picked up this very tangible item. And I think that's the big difference, is that, yes, information is information, and information should be accessible in many, many different ways. Um, you know, if I'm driving and I need some directions, I used to use the Rand McNally Atlas and kept that in my trunk and kept it nearby and, you know, driving down the road and opening up that atlas and leafing through to find, you know, Birmingham, Alabama, where's the, you know, where, where's the library? Uh, <laughs> you know, maybe it's better that I let my phone talk to me uh, now through those directions. But when you, when you're holding a book, you're holding an artifact and it is, an artifact that you can return to. And when you do that, especially, uh, like you say, Patricia, if you write in it, then you will connect to yourself and you'll connect to other people. And even yourself was another person, maybe in another time, who had those thoughts, who had those feelings, who encountered this thing for the first time. And so there's something about the artifact of it. Uh, we do have many books. Um, available through the Dean Library that belong to Oppie Purse, uh, that belong to Lydia Ray, that you can still see the, you know, the notations and the signature and the um, ex libris uh, notes. So I think that's something we can, we can really gain traction with young people. You know, Alan Lomax, the folklorist, used to talk about you know, when everything goes digital and everything is living in this digital world, the young people are going to look to us and say, what happened to all the things? Where did it go? So I don't think it's their responsibility to know the value of it. I think it's our responsibility to teach them the value of it and to, and to put some things in their hands and say, doesn't that feel good? And who else turned that page? Who else life took a different path? because they just read the same page that you did. And so this is a beautiful book, too, I want to say. There's a lot of um, really well put together. But I think it's that physical experience um, that, you know, we are of five senses. And it's an important one. So holding it means a lot. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And before I end, I would like to ask uh, Chancellor Augustus to please come up. <laughs> Chancellor Augustus, one of the things we'd like to do on behalf of the Franklin Library Association and the Franklin Public Library is to, prevent, is to present to you a copy of this history of the Library Association. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, we, we talked earlier about just the close relationship between Oliver Dean as also the first president of the Franklin Library, and we want to honor that oh, relationship. So and you also get a bookmark so that you'll know. <laughs> you can talk to Ken as well. He has one too. You guys nice, might want to race nice. to see who finishes it first. 
Um, the sense is preferable to sound. Oh, I love so it. please take I this it. as Thank a gift from so us. Much. Thank you. And in closing, I would just like to say thank you to Patricia, to Jim, and to Robert. And let's give them a big hand. This program was made possible by your Franklin friends and neighbors. Good folks, just like you. Thanks for supporting Franklin TV. And thanks for watching.